All right, everybody. Um, this is day two of you know coronavirus homeschool, and so these are the videos going to be played April sixth through the tenth. We're going to focus on the industrial revolution. I had a great activity I so badly wanted to do with you guys, or if we were in school. But remember, Rangers, RLTW, we got to do what we have to do. My office hours are going to be from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. So if you need to get a hold of me, more um, as needed. I would love to schedule a Google Meet just to check in and see how everybody is doing on Monday, April 13th. Um, but you know, I know I've talked to a couple of you and your parents on email. Let me know what you guys need to help you out here at this time. Whoops, hang on a second. I just had something fall. I'm doing school in your garage is always eventful guys um, trust me on that one so anyway don't know how this is working um, we're just going to do the best we can here so anyhow um, the industrial revolution um, is something um, unique and you know we've just talked about the transatlantic economy and, you know, these absolute monarchs like Louis XIV and Peter the Great, how they become crazy, incredibly rich. Another change is going to take place at this time that's going to build into the age of revolutions, like the French Revolution and the Haitian um, Revolution. And in 1750, um, the economy of Northwestern Europe, specifically Great Britain is going to begin to change. They're going to go from that old feudal past where everybody is a farmer and become modern industrial countries. This is going to set Northwestern Europe apart from the rest of the world. Everyone is kind of equal at this time, um, especially the Islamic empires of the Ottomans, the Safavids, and the Mughals, but this is going to shoot Europe to the forefront. Shortly thereafter, North America, the United States, is going to industrialize as well. And it's industrialization that will give Europeans access to a large quantity of new goods. Their things are so good and so well made and so technologically revolutionary it creates an international market where people will pay whatever price the Europeans want to get this money. So Western Europe and the United States are going to exchange finished products in exchange for raw materials. So we're going to have to go out and capture these raw materials from everybody else and bring them back. I will take raw materials from you and in return sell you a nice finished product. And so the Industrial Revolution is going to begin in merry old England, where at this time there are nice little villages and, and little towns and some port cities. And then there's big industrial London. And over 50 to 60 years, it is going to change rapidly. The Industrial Revolution begins in England because they are disconnected from continental Europe. A lot of the wars and problems that will plague um, continental Europe will not have any effect on Great Britain as well. Great Britain also has a large quantity of raw materials, iron ore, coal, bauxite, things that will be used for industrialization. And because of the Magna Carta and the English Bill of Rights, um, we talked about in the age of absolutism, at least I, I think uh, you know, we finished that, um, society is freer than those on the continent. You know, when William and Mary um, you know, come into um, Parliament um, and they agree to these new rules, the English Bill of Rights, the guys in England have a little bit of freedom of speech, a little bit of freedom of the press. They can go to Hyde Park and stand on this stone and say, the government's full of scum sucking rich guys. And on the continent, you said that, you would get your head chopped off. And England has the best banking system in Europe at this time. So as a result, 
as Europe goes out to a big lead over the rest of the world, Great Britain is out to a big lead over Europe. And the idea comes from new methods of production. And a new method of production is just a brand simple new way of doing things. Like I am filming this lecture on a wall in my garage um, because this is the new method of homeschool teaching since the coronavirus. Again, I hope everyone is safe out there. So it's a brand new way or, or a, a twist on a way to do something a little different. In, industri in the Industrial Revolution, it's better, it's faster, and it's stronger. And what was going on was during the winters in Europe, um, people, after working spring, summer, and fall, planting their crops and harvesting their crops and tending their sheep, would sit inside during the cold, dark months of winter, and they would pull and, you know, um, thread wool sheared from the sheep and weave it into cloth, like pulling it through an eyelet from like a fishing pole, you know, from big to medium to small, making, spinning that wool into thread or yarn. But in the spring, textile manufacturers, clothing manufacturers would come by and buy that wool from the villagers as they went back to their farm work. Problem is, this is going to create a bottleneck in the system. As all of a sudden, Great Britain is growing. Great Britain has its colonies overseas. Demand is outgrowing supply. And you know, the people, now that they're back in their in their farm work, once they sell their, their wool to the textile merchant in the spring, that's all the factories are going to get until the next springtime, a year later. So how do we handle this? Well, a guy named Richard Arkwright is going to be in his, you know, garage, basically, kind of like me, and a lot of his neighbors actually thought he was practicing witchcraft. He invents the spinning jenny, which is, think of like your grandma's old, like, foot pumper sewing machine, but it is a wheel, mechanical wheel, a gear cog that will be turned by water that will constantly rotate the spool and it will take that wool and spin it into thread mechanically without a person having it. It will straighten and comb out and thread that wool into yarn. And it will work 24 hours a day because it's powered by water. And the spinning jenny, here it is down in the you know, bottom corner is a great idea, but the game changer is going to be the steam engine of James Watt. James Watt's steam engine will revolutionize world history, all right? The steam engine is the number one invention of the industrial revolution. You have a steady, reliable source of power, right? It was invented to originally pump water out of a coal mine. But this, you know, steam engine doesn't get work, or doesn't get tired, it doesn't need a break, it can work in sunny weather, it can work at night, it can work in rainy weather, it can work in snowy weather, it doesn't have to be fed like a human being, or a horse, or an ox, it runs all the time. And working with a couple friends, the steam engine, is going to be portable. Now you can pick it up, all right? You don't have to be next to a river or tied to a windmill. The steam engine can be transported. And when stuck onto a larger engine, like a train or a ship, you can go farther and faster than ever before. If you're on a ship, you can now go against the current. You can go against the wind because you have mechanical power. When the first trains were made, they were going 20 miles an hour. Now for us, we're like, my God, that is so slow, you could get out and run faster than 20 miles an hour, right? Like that's 25 mile an hour speed limit on Weaver Dairy Extension. Man, you've got a wide road, you've got a bike lane and a sidewalk. Why is there only 25 through there? But whatever. The average distance a person could walk um, in a day was about 20 miles. On a horse, you can do 60. Now, all of a sudden, on a steam engine, you could go 20 miles an hour. That would mean, 
right? In just a few short hours, in three hours, you could go 60 miles. In six hours, you could go 120. That was astronomical. People were afraid to ride it. I was joking about the speed limit on Weaver Dairy Road. People thought that going 20 was going so fast that their skin would fly off of their skeleton. But the big problem for all this is creating the production of iron. And to get iron, like that piece of iron ore I showed you guys, you need a really hot furnace known as a blast furnace. And the hotter you got the ore, the more impurities would burn off, and the stronger the iron that you know comes out would be. And they were powering their blast furnace by wood. If you go to England, you'll see there's not a whole lot of forest because they were chopped down. So we got to find a way to get a hotter fire. We can do that with coal, but you can't have a guy standing there shoveling coal into the blast furnace all the time. Well, the steam engine, if you attach it to a pulley, can constantly feed coal into the blast furnace, a little bit at a time, 24 hours, keeping the furnace hot, smelting or melting the iron ore out of the rock. Now that we've got better iron, we're creating the steam engine, the, the trains, and the steamships. More material can now be transported from point A to point B than ever before. Very quickly, the Industrial Revolution and the steam engine is changing the world. And so now, when we put it on a boat, we can take it farther, we can take it faster and heavier loads than we could overland dragging it on a horse and a wagon. So this might be kind of the idea um, where we're going to, we got about seven or eight more minutes. If you look at this, this is a picture of New York City at the turn of the century. You've got just, you know, uh, you've got a streetcar, one here, one here. You've got wagons of goods. You've got people willy-nilly everywhere in a tight space. The Industrial Revolution is going to cause a major shift in society. It's going to cause a rural to urban movement where people are going to leave the farms and they're going to move the city, move to the city for farm work. Later on, Europeans will immigrate to the United States to get more land and better jobs. And so it causes these cities to explode rapidly. And the activity I wanted to do with you guys was we would start, you know, some of you guys who are good artists, you know, like Alan and, you know, Lucky and Drew, some of you other guys, um, you know, and then we would start drawing. And then at the end of the class period, we'd start with a little European village. And pretty soon we'd have a giant city like this, adding factories and houses and tenements and hospitals, it was just going to go crazy. Right? So think about Chapel Hill here. When I moved down here in the early 90s, North Carolina wasn't visited by a lot of like presidential candidates because the population wasn't that big. Now you look nearly 30 years later, we're a campaign stop because so many people have moved here for UNC, for, for Duke, for the Research Triangle to get jobs population has exploded. I'm sure many of you parents came here for a um, job. And so what's this going to cause is the old you know, important cities are going to die out. They are going to fade. Old trade routes are banned. If you guys remember when you were kids and you watched um, um, Cars with Lightning McQueen, he traveled Old Route 66 that was the main highway well, when I-40 was built, nobody traveled Route 66 anymore, and all those businesses in Carburetor Canyon um, kind of died off. And so the way I look at it, you know, being, being from you know, the Cleveland-Pittsburgh area, if you look at the old rust bucket cities, the Pittsburghs, the Buffaloes, the Clevelands, Youngstowns, Detroits, and Chicagos, all those old cities that were powerful People, they're losing population as people are coming south to places like Raleigh, to Charlotte, or to Atlanta, where the new jobs are. The old cities are dying, and new cities are being created. That's exactly what happened. Like I told you about my buddy and the Lordstown um, industrial plan. New cities 
are going to begin to crop up along the coastlines. So you, in England, you're going to get places like Dover and Portsmouth and Plymouth. And if you look at it, if you go, if you go back in time, in the 1500s, that's a misclaimer, this should be, there were only 64 cities with a population of over 10,000, and only four had a population of over 100,000. Towns were just not that big with all this pollution, you know, burrowing here. So in 1500, most cities were like, you know, here in Hillsboro, where you've got 10, 8 to 10,000 people maximum. While by 1800, there will be 363 cities. Now, this is going to be correct. We're going to add 300 cities with a population of over 10,000. And 17 cities have a population of over 100,000. And as the cities grow, populations begin to shift. And so people are going to leave the countryside. They're going to move to the urban cities. The old cities are going to die out because they're no longer important. And new cities are going to be created. But in the cities, things are expensive. And remember, the early stages took place in the countryside. As it was cheaper, out there labor is cheaper and land is cheaper. And so, forgive me if you're from South Carolina, um, it's just, you know, a neighboring state. And we got the two twin brothers down there, Ricky Bobby and Richard Robert. If you go to Florida along I-95, you'll see in Georgia, everyone's got a, or in South Carolina, every police officer has got a Dodge Charger in some places, some places um, BMWs. As corporations like Toyota and Honda, BMW, um, Volkswagen, and Chrysler are moving down here to the south in right-to-work states. To put that same car together in Detroit, they would have to pay United Auto Workers employee like $28 an hour. Remember my buddy Bob that I told you about. That's in the big city. Well, down here in the south, South Carolina will give huge chunks of land to build these factories. They'll give them tax abatements saying you don't have to pay taxes on this for a decade if you employ my citizens. To sweeten the pot... Chrysler will say, fine, we'll give every police officer and highway patrolman a Dodge Charger to do their work in. It is an incentive. Now, Chrysler knows this because building their factory will be dirt cheap in South Carolina. Instead of paying Bob $28 an hour, they're paying Ricky Bobby and Richard Robert, look at this, Ricky Bobby, we're going to get $14 an hour to work at Chrysler. Yeah, man, let's go. All right? $14 an hour, they're saving 50%, right? Because in the South, it's a right-to-work state, there are no unions. I can get a cheaper factory built and pay my labor cheaper just because it's in a more rural area. And here's how these new cities and towns, think of Cary, and I will stop with this. Um, as these factories are built, you're going to need support services. And I use the factory Lordstown, like I, I told you guys about. You've got a factory that will employ 250,000 workers in three shifts around the clock, seven days a week. That's three quarters of a million people. Well, those factory workers need houses to live in. So you need carpenters, construction workers, plumbers, electricians. Their kids need schools to go to. They need grocery stores to shop at. They need garbage men and firemen and policemen. They need hardware stores and clothing stores. And they need entertainment. So they need movie theaters, restaurants, putt-putt golf courses. So around the factory grows an entire town of support services. And that's great if you're one of these burgeoning new cities. But if you're in an older city, those jobs begin to quickly die out. So we transfer from this nice little English garden into this massive, massive factory. So new growth in urban areas as new jobs are created. We're going to pick up here tomorrow. Stay strong, stay strong, guys. Let me know if you need anything. And please take a look at Google Classroom. Talk to you guys soon.